So without further ado, I'll hand over to the, the, the masters here as the moderator tonight, um, Professor Colin McLeod, who's the executive director of the Melbourne Entrepreneurial Centre, which is uh, the home of MAP. So Colin, thanks so much for taking the time tonight to being here and I'll hand over to you to welcome our esteemed panel. Thanks, Tim, and thanks for all your work in, in organising this event. Um, I think we might just get straight into it. And I'd just like to welcome the members of our panel. Uh, firstly, Mike Klein, who's the US Consul General to, to Melbourne. And you know, we've worked closely with Mike on a number of events now. And uh, we're going to hear a bit more about a, a, a sort of passion project that Mike's involved with around startups in, in Melbourne and helping them do business in, in the US. Um, Wei Su. Uh, Wei is the COO of, uh, of Navi. Um, Navi is a, is a med tech company. And I think we would all appreciate that uh, med tech's pretty hot in the US at the moment for obvious reasons, but it's not a it's it's an area that uh, also has some challenges, as you can imagine, you know, regulatory and, and legal and so on, and also just the time and, and cultural difference. So we'll we'll find out some more from Way about about Navi, and um, finally Rachel Newman. Uh, Rachel and I have worked together on a number of projects, not the least being. Um, the VC Catalyst Program for uh, at the Wade Institute on behalf of uh, Lawrence Vic. So we've done a lot of work together, particularly around um, uh, angel investment. And I think many of you would know that Rachel has recently launched her, her own fund, uh, Working Theory Angels. And so we'll hear a bit more about it and its, its connection potentially to the US. But Mike, maybe I'll start with you. And I always think it's, uh, we, we run into each other a lot. So I, I, I feel like I have a pretty fair idea of what the consul, what a consul general does, but I always think it's a good starting point for people to understand that there are people like you whose job it is to really help them go to America and set up businesses. Sure, thanks, Colin. Um, really, really happy to be here. Thanks to you and for Tim for organizing this and for everyone that's, that's dialed in. Um, I'm the consul general for the US sitting here in Melbourne. My consul district includes Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania, and the Northern Territory. And my job is pretty simple. My job is to promote trade, promote investment, and promote the US-Australia alliance. I've been here for about two and a half years doing that. It's been a great, it's been a great run. Thanks, Mike. And I've got to say, normally when we, when we see people in, in your sort of role, they're, they're often, I guess, um, a bit focused on the top end of town, but I know you've been very active in looking at the startup community. And we're going to talk a bit about your podcast a little later. But um, as I mentioned before, you and I run into each other, a lot of entrepreneurial events, a lot of startup events. Um, you've been very active in bringing some major investors from the US out to Australia to sort of showcase Australian startups. Why did you get involved in the startup community? Yeah, thanks, Colin. It, uh, you know, it really started when I arrived in Melbourne back in in July, August of 2018, I noticed a huge disconnect between the people that I was meeting at the very nice Welcome to Melbourne Consul General events and the people I was just seeing downtown in the CBD. When I walked around the CBD, I would see so many young people from all over the world and be very diverse and multicultural, dynamic and energetic. And I was going to, at the same time, these Welcome to Melbourne events where I was just meeting the same people who were all very nice and welcoming, but were of a very homogenous de demographic, you know, white people about 100 years old. And I know from what I saw on the CBD, there's more to it than that. And that's where I started. I, I literally got a map in my office of the whole Melbourne metropolitan area and a box of thumbtacks. And we started going neighborhood by neighborhood finding like what person in their 20s do we know in Collingwood, <laughs> right? Broadmeadows, Springvale, everywhere. And then we'd call them up and say, hey, there's a new CG in town. He wants to go to your neighborhood, and meet you and meet five friends that we've never met before. And I started doing that. And for the first six, seven, eight months in town, I was going neighborhood to neighborhood, having coffees with strangers. But it was so fascinating because in any group of five or six of these young people I was meeting, there would always be at least one who was either a startup founder or had this idea of a startup in fintech or cyber tech or biotech or space tech or on and on and on. And that's where light bulbs started to go off. There's so much in common here between places like Boston and San Francisco and Austin and Boulder. And I saw it as something else. that's where I could add value by building these bridges and connections between young people with dreams here and people with the same conversations in the US. And I started doing that by, um, like, you, you, like you mentioned, trying to introduce investors when they came into town for the Australia Open or other events like that, 
to groups of innovators and founders and startups here. And that was successful, but I found it difficult to scale. It was hard. I was doing it pretty well retail, but I wanted to, to do more. And that's where the, the podcast idea came up of interviewing people who had successfully built that bridge from Melbourne, Australia to the US to investors, to markets, to capital, and putting their stories in a, in a place where other people could be inspired by that, learn from their lessons, and, and that's, what, that's what brought me to today. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you more about the, uh, your, your podcast because I, I think they're well worth talking about. Um, but maybe, maybe I just might introduce uh, Wei first. I've got to admit, when I, when I first met Wei and Navi and they told me what they were working on, I thought that cannot be a problem in the 21st century. Uh, for anyone with kids, you're about to be shocked. So, Wei, maybe you can you can tell everyone a little bit of, about Navi, um, and, and I guess maybe a little bit about just what took. We'll, we'll talk a little more about your experience in the US, but I guess for now, what took you to the US? Why did you see the US as an opportunity? So, if you could tell us a bit about Navi and then the US opportunity. For sure, thanks, Colin, and I'll I'd like to echo uh, Mike's. Um, Gratitude to everyone, the organizers and everyone else involved in dialing in on a sort of early evening after hours to, to hear about our perspectives on this. So um, Navi is an early stage medical device company. Uh, we're based in Melbourne, Australia, founded in 2017 off the bat of um, biodesign innovation course, which was a course that was jointly offered by um, the Melbourne Business School as well as the biomedical engineering department in the University of Melbourne. So um, we very literally took it from the classroom to the real world and now from Australia to the US, hopefully. Um, so our vision is, is really around creating brighter, healthier futures for critically ill children through medical innovations. And what we're starting with and the problem that Colin alluded to is really focusing on um, neonatal uh, placement of central lines. So with our first product, the NeoNav, which is an ECG tip location system. Uh, I'll spend a bit of time talking through uh, what that is and the problem that we're solving. And um, that might provide a bit of context as well as to why the US has, uh, why we've identified the US as an attractive market. So um, for those of you who, uh, um, who, who may be aware or are across some of these uh, uh, or have some um, interactions with the medical uh, uh, clinical settings, um, safe and reliable intravascular access is really critical for the treatment and survival of critically ill newborns or children in intensive care settings. So central lines or central catheters, uh, including umbilical venous catheters or other forms of catheters are inserted into the veins of newborn patients uh, to allow delivery of life-saving infusions, be they um, treatments, antibiotics, or for uh, uh, nutrition. Uh, the trick with that is uh, placing these catheter tips accurately is critical to the safe delivery of these drugs or nutrients. And um, these catheter tips need to be correctly placed both during the insertion process and also post-insertion for the duration with which they stay in the neonatal or newborn patient. Problem is, with current standard of care, clinicians essentially estimate the length of the catheter and the insertion is performed without any real-time feedback and really re relies quite heavily on the clinician's um, skill and level of experience and expertise in order to, and, uh, in order to ensure accurate placement. X-rays are now required as part of standard, um, uh, as part of the most hospitals standard of care and x-rays are required to confirm that the catheters have been placed in an accurate location before a line can be used simply because um, a misplaced line can actually lead to quite severe complications in some very vulnerable patient populations unfortunately around 40 percent of these insertion attempts are misplaced and even with skillful fixation up to half of the catheter tips that are placed and secured can migrate to potentially dangerous locations within the first week of placement. So our product, the Neonaf, is a medical device that provides that real-time tip location feedback as central lines are being placed or can also be used at the bedside for monitoring, uh, for monitoring purposes to ensure that these catheter tips, which are life-saving products that are placed in little babies and children, 
uh, continue to remain in a safe location for use of delivery of drugs and nutrients. So as you can see, our product really targets um, um, the patient population, so newborns or young children. And um, the main attractiveness of the US market is simply the number of births and the number of procedures that are performed there just far exceeds that what we can get in Australia. Um, happy to speak to that in further detail later on, Colin, maybe. Thanks, Wei. And, uh, and to, to Rachel, um, I think anyone who knows Rachel we knows she wears a number of different hats. She's been on the board of Startup Australia. She was an inaugural director of, of, of Launch Vic. Um, she's been active. Um, I must think you can never be an informal angel, angel investor, but as a sort of private angel investor for um, quite a few years. Uh, you've lived and worked and gone to college in Silicon Valley. I know you're very deeply connected with entrepreneurs and, and investors in, in the US. Um, so there's two things I want you to do. One is tell us a little bit about why you became, I guess, a formal angel investor through Working Theory Angels. And secondly, what sort of company, what sort of Australian companies do you think make good candidates for expansion to the US? Colin, and um, it's great to be on this panel with a fellow American and um, Wei, I've been admiring her company since I first saw them uh, present at a Met Gala, we just uh, realized a few years back. So um, thank you again for having me. Um, so just quickly, um, my journey to becoming a, a full-time investor um, started with me as an operator. So uh, I was the managing director of a San Francisco-based startup called Eventbrite. Well, I should say I, I first was uh, San Francisco-based. And when we were expanding globally, um, we saw a huge opportunity to bring our business to Australia as one of the very first global markets. Um, and the reason for that is Australia is a wonderful market. If you are US, US based com a US-based company, to come to Australia, there are a ton of advantages. So we have a very educated, uh, technologically savvy population with a high GDP per capita. Um, we have our population here concentrated in just a few key cities. So you can come to Australia, focus on a few cities and unlock a large portion of the population as customers. Um, and Australians are actually very open to innovation. So this is a great test market. We always joke also that Australia is far enough away that if you really mess up and an experiment goes, pear goes you know, pear-shaped, not too many people need to find out about it. Um, and so when Eventbrite was expanding to Australia, I came over as managing director and I set up that business here um, and then scaled it through um, throughout Australia, New Zealand, and then up through Asia PAC. Um, and so as an operator, uh, I you know, obviously had some hands-on experience on how to grow and scale companies internationally um, and in this market. When I left Eventbrite and I started working with other of our leading startups here in Australia, I realized, you know, one, I was leveraging some of my learnings and the skills that I had developed to help grow those companies. And I realized, I was like, if I am backing myself and then I'm helping to create and unlock value for this company, um, why don't I put my money where my mouth is? And so I started to make some small investments in the companies I was advising that were really in my power lane. They're either in the industry or in the functional areas in which I had expertise. And then it was through, you know, making those small early bets in what I called my power lane that I started to actually realize that it was the craft of investing was something that I um, that I loved and that I wanted to pursue. And so then I started getting comfort investing in different industries, um, always at a similar stage, which is early. And that's for two reasons. Um, one, there is a huge need for us to invest in an early stage. I care deeply about the Australian ecosystem. Um, to be honest, I mean, I'm motivated because I have young kids who are growing up here and I want them to inherit an economy that's built on the future and not on the past. And so I think it's my duty as someone who feels unbelievably grateful that I get to call Australia home, that I want to help to build this economy. Um, and so uh, our overall ecosystem success is predicated on our ability to get funding into that early stage. So that's the first reason I focus on early stage. The second is that it's a lot of fun. Um, there's nothing more um, energizing than working with incredible founders who are passionate and um, educated and um, are really identifying major customer pain points and coming up with incredible uh, game-changing solutions. So investing started to be, you know, the power lane uh, more generally of, you know, how I want to spend my time. And, you know, 
I like to believe that I'm adding some value to the investments that I make, but I know that it's, um, it pales in, in comparison to the learning and the incredible experience I get uh, with the founders with whom I work. So that's been uh, my, invest in, my investment journey. And then last year, as you alluded to, Colin, I spun up Working Theory Angels um, as um, an angel group because I had been investing individually. Lots of other uh, passionate people were coming up to me and saying, how can I get involved? How can I either get the confidence or the competence to invest? Um, and so we have education programs like BC Catalyst, which are amazing, but not everyone um, has the opportunity to do it, although I do, of course, encourage anyone who can to join the, that program. But they said, okay, like, if I have the education piece, then how do I get deal flow? And one of the things we know about early stage is in order to get, you know, 10 investments in the year, like, I'm looking at literally hundreds, if not a thousand companies in order to get those 10 quality investments. So how do I deal with deal flow? And then again, if you're doing early stage right and you're writing lots of small checks, um, some of those great companies don't want all those tiny little checks on the cap table. So how can I help to kind of pull us all together um, and you know slide into the cap table as one line? So Working Theory was born out of that. We're slightly different than other angel groups in that my investors come in as a cohort we all pre-commit a certain amount of capital and that creates almost a virtual fund so that we deploy that over the course of 10 investments. And that gives a lot of transparency and predictability around how many checks I'm writing, what size checks, and it allows the founders and I to have conversations that um, are very transparent because we know what the minimum uh, check size is. So that is my journey to becoming an investor. Your question, uh, your second question was around what companies are uh, right to go to America. And my answer is, like everyone, um, almost every company that I invest in is global from day one and is looking at a global opportunity. And again, as an investor, some of the returns that I want to see, or better put, the impact I want to see on the world requires us to leave the Australian shores for larger markets to have a greater impact on people. Um, and so it's a pretty early conversation, even when we're just getting to know each other, when I think about what is their global expansion plan, what are some of the markets they're looking to unlock, and of course the US is a very large and ripe market for most products. Um, it is English speaking. I, I joke we almost speak the same language. Um, so certainly there are nuances and there are cultural differences you need to navigate as you set up a business there. Um, but really to be investable, um, I am looking for companies to either be in America from day one or looking to unlock that US market pretty quickly. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mike, we, we, we do need to talk about your, your podcast and you, you've given a bit of a background to it, but um, I think the three of us, uh, the other three on the panel, um, probably know many of the people on it. You've really put together a stellar list of uh, Australian startups, uh, venture capitalists and, and, and what have you. So maybe tell us a little bit about the podcast. And I guess what you, I guess the key lessons that you've learned from their experience in going to the US. Sure. Thanks, Colin. It, um... It's been a lot of fun to talk to these founders, like uh, yeah, starting from episode one with uh, Didier Elzinger from Culture Amp, um, and then Patrick Llewellyn from 99 Designs, and just lots of folks that um, you know learned a lot of hard lessons going out to the U.S. And all these different journeys are all these journeys are different, and we we intentionally chose people from very different sectors. We have a rough balance of men and women. We have a rough balance of startups that, that went to the States in the early stages, companies that went a little bit later. So all these, all these experiences are different, but some commonalities did really start to shine through the more people I spoke with. And, um, and it comes out in these episodes. One is the, uh, that culture issue where the U S and Australia, yeah, we're pretty close, but there's some real differences and, the one that keeps coming up is the, uh, you know, this, the great Australian tendency of downplaying achievements and kind of being self-deprecating, which really makes being living in Australia a nice place to be because it's a very humble sort of uh, attitude to have. But when you take that and go to Silicon Valley, and you're suddenly in an atmosphere where everybody's expected to have an idea that's going to change the world and i'm going to show you how there's sometimes there's there's a bit of a uh, a learning curve there that a lot of people go through and as um 
um, one of my guests, uh, Nick Crocker from Blackbird Ventures, you know, he says he works with a lot of founders with this issue. He said, he tells people, when you go to the US, you've got to amp up your ambition and amp up your confidence. And he said, even when you're at that point where you're not comfortable with what you're saying, what you hear yourself saying, you're still falling flat compared to your average US founder. You know, there's just like this level of confidence out there that um, a lot culturally, a lot of Australians need to adjust to. And the founders I talk to all seem to go through that journey to one extent or another. Another theme that shows up in the podcast time and time again are the importance of networks. And whether it, these are networks of Australian founders, literally the Aussie Founders Network in, in California and in New York, or networks of founders that people find themselves into one way or the other, and they find it very, very helpful, just an attitude of people helping each other out and willing to, willing to lend a hand and make introductions. And a lot of people find uh, so refreshing when they go out to, to the United States. So that keeps coming up. And then another thing that I just can't, I can't help missing in all of these episodes is the element of what seems like chance. There's so many times there is an element of, I was sitting next to somebody on an airplane, we had a conversation that led to something else, or I was sitting next to somebody in a, in a coffee shop and I was talking, and that led to an introduction. And these ended up being such pivotal moments in the journeys of so many founders that it was just unmistakable that that, that was there, but it's not chance. You know, that comes up so often, uh. tells me it's not chance. And as somebody put it, um, it's just putting yourself out there and creating these opportunities for chance to develop, expanding the surface area of, of serendipity is how one person put it. And that keeps coming up as well. So those are three main themes that, that keep coming up in all these conversations. But each journey is different. And that's why I, I, love, I love going through and, and having these conversations. And, and why, from a, from a Navi perspective, was there anything about you know, Mike's comments about, about these findings that, that uh, resonate with you or has your journey been different again? Um, so I should mention that in terms of our journey, where we're at, we're, we're still pre-revenue. Um, our product is still very much in, uh, we're at a clinical prototype phase and we've been able to get there with our uh, partners here in Melbourne, Australia, uh, the Royal Women's Hospital and um, the clinicians that we've had very good relationships with here. Uh, so what, where we're at in terms of going to the US, uh, given that we're um, at least a year, if not two away from having a product in market, given regulatory pathways, et cetera, which I can also elaborate on. Um, we have established a uh, US subsidiary recently in the last sort of um, quarter of 2020, despite COVID. Um, and we've also, uh, but prior to that, we've also had the opportunity to establish very, uh, uh, very, very strong and healthy relationships with um, hospitals and clinicians in the US, um, thanks to um, the Pediatric Device Consortia, which um, again, I can talk through a little bit um, later on. It's basically a network or, of um, children's hospitals that um, receive some funding from the FDA in recognition of the underserved uh, market that is pediatric devices in, in the US. But also speaks to uh, a problem or a gap um, worldwide. So with that experience in mind, um, I have to say we ha uh, the, the second point that Mike raised around the willingness and the positive attitude of um, um, people we've come across in the US uh, to just facilitate connection, introductions, have a chat and share experiences, that definitely rings true. Um, we have in fact probably um, built, um, in, in some cases, built um, much better relationships with um, hospitals and clinicians in the US, um, um, specifically key opinion leaders. Again, it's a bit of a numbers game in that um, there's just so many more hospitals and the hospitals are so much bigger in the US that um, we, we um, it's not, not, not speaking ill of you know um, the the networks and relationships we have here locally in Australia, which have been very helpful as well. But definitely rings true in that people are very willing to help. Um, we have also attended conferences in the US where we've found people very forthcoming with um, advice and with uh, introductions and relationships. And 
One thing that rings true as well is when we speak to the problem or the need that we're addressing, that, that resonates very much with um, clinicians and nurses who have been in situations and experienced personally the challenges that they face when they're trying to place a tiny little silicon tube in a newborn baby that needs it desperately to, uh, for, for, for life-saving reasons. So um, that's certainly been true. I, I'm not, I can't speak so much on behalf of um, the company's experience around the cultural difference um, relating to, you know, the Australian tendency to downplay achievement. You are speaking to an Asian female. So um, in terms of downplaying achievements, um, probably some personal experiences that I can relate to there. Um, and I, I can imagine it would be much more um, stark in the US in, in, some, in some places. Um, yeah, so definitely those couple of those themes definitely resonated. I, I did uh, work at Berkeley for a couple of years in the 90s and even then someone did, someone made the comment to me, um, modesty isn't a highly regarded value in, the, in Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, Rachel, one of the big appeals for Australians going to Silicon Valley in, in particular and America more generally, is just the size of the venture capital market. I think there was something like $150 billion invested by VCs last year. And at the moment, there's more money available to be invested than is actually invested. So there is a bit of a sense of this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, um, but it's a highly competitive market, highly competitive market for good ideas, highly competitive market to get, to get investment. What would be your advice to anyone going to the US looking for venture capital? Yeah, and I, Colin, as you were crafting your question, you said, there's so much capital available, I quickly said, but there's so many people competing for that capital. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I mean, that's absolutely true. And I think to, um, you know, Michael's point earlier, it's about how you present your ambition um, and your achievements that will help you get some of that cut through. Um, first of all, I have never you know, people often ask, where do Australian founders sit kind of on the global founder talent scale? And it's like, I have never met smarter, more ambitious, uh, more capable founders than I have here in Australia. We have all the right raw ingredients that can create incredible founders. We have one on the call with us now. Um, and so there is no doubt in my mind that Australian founders can compete on the global stage and can compete in that global contest for those venture capital dollars. Um, it comes down to, I think, three things. The first one is network, right? And so Michael mentioned this and it, it, it really is um, something that I think Australians can do a little bit better at, you know, Americans. And I think it's because, um, you know, Australian networks happen because we tend to kind of grow up in the same, like we're born somewhere, we live here, we grow up, we have natural networks that are created with our family, our neighborhoods, our communities, our sport, our schools. And so we don't have to work that hard. In America, we all get dispersed very quickly. And so in order to create community, whether it's for professional or for personal reasons, we work harder at maintaining, building and maintaining relationships. And so I think that um, Australians who want to go overseas or even want to, you know, maximize the opportunity in Australia, you should think about networking um, as a craft. And it's not about collecting people and, you know, using them, but it's thinking about like, how can I add value here? How can I help out? And that, that karma like really does come back. Um, I want to just quickly, you know, Mike mentioned three people's names that are on the podcast, Didier, Patrick Llewellyn, and Nick Crocker. Um, I'm going to just quickly tell you a 30 second story that proves how important network is. So, um, Didier and I met because at Eventbrite, I was one of his first customers. So I got to meet CultureAmp because we were a customer. When we decided to launch in Australia, we moved over here and Patrick Llewellyn, who was living in the Bay Area at the time, our head of PR was his next door neighbor. So Patrick said, when your team lands, you can have some desks in the 99designs office. So it was great. So then I met Patrick working over at the Inspire 9 building in the 99designs office. When we were growing out of our space, 
Um, oh, I should say when I was still living in San Francisco, there was a program called Elevate 61 that used to happen. And that's where Australian companies would come to Silicon Valley to learn how to you know, penetrate the US market. And Nick Crocker and I spoke on a panel together. And that's how Nick and I met. And then when we grew out of 99designs office, we found out there were desks available on the level below. And who do you think my desk mate was? But Didier. So, uh, you know, build your network because it is a very small community. And if I think about how often now Patrick, um, Nick, and Didier and I, I was just texting with Didier yesterday. I'm having dinner with him tonight. We like the network, how often we call upon each other for favors, for information, for insight, for uh, introductions is really powerful. So one, Australians take your network very seriously and Australians especially are always willing to help someone out. So um, return the favor and pay it forward, help out others who, um, who are looking, you know, that, that you can assist as well. So the number one thing is networking. Um, the second is when you get an opportunity to, you know, pitch to that Australian, to that US VC capital, that's where, to Mike's point, you really want to uncomfortably um, celebrate the opportunity, the ambition that you have, and the um, demonstrated success you've had in that in that space. Um, and then, you know, the third part is, um, you know, just demonstrating hustle. Not everyone will have, a, you know, an immediate network. Um, and so some people have to hustle to get in front of some of these venture capitalists. You'd be like, I heard this, a, a company that I'm invested in, um, they had gone to Silicon Valley for kind of a study tour and they had, you know, sat at, I think it was Andreessen Horowitz and, you know, heard a VC speak about fundraising, but there was never a personal interaction. They were one of many. And then later they were going from restaurant to, or to bar to bar and fake pitching their product because they were actually just testing how does my pitch resonate in the US market. <laughs> All of a sudden a guy turns around and he was the VC at Andreessen Horowitz who had just been presenting to this group and said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm just practicing my pitch. I wanna see how it resonates in the US market. And the guy said, come see me tomorrow at lunch. So American VCs can see hustle and they love it. And so if you don't have someone to introduce you into Andreessen Horowitz, figure out how you hustle. How do you get in front of them? How do you, you know, contact them on LinkedIn and put together a really thoughtful pitch that's going to catch her, uh, catch the investor's eye and she's going to want to, you know, call you. Um, how do you find out who you have a connection in common? Like pound the pavement. There is a lot of hustle that happens in the States. And I think Australians would do well by, um, you know, putting that hustle out on display. So those are the three things. Network and, you know, always become from a giving first mentality. Um, you know, the second is the hustle. And what was that middle one I said? Oh, speak, talk, talk yourself up. You know, oh. you're just, Australian founders are just as good as any other founder in the world. Um, and so believe that. And if you don't quite believe it, fake it until you do. Thanks, Raj. Um, I should just say to the audience, we, we are going to start taking questions in, in a couple of minutes. So we've got one there, which is a very dear to my heart, and uh, Rachel might recognise um, a, a common theme there, which I'll, I'll raise with her. Um, Mike, I, I suspect that many people may have noticed that there's been a change in the White House in the last uh, last month or so. And I know that um, uh, the new president's only been there for a few weeks. I think he's still getting his, his cabinet uh, finalised. But he, he does seem, for, you know, for obvious reasons, to be very focused on, on med tech in particular. Um, I know that he's um, uh, made a couple of comments and signed a few executive orders around around climate change. And they seem to be some of the areas that might sort of flourish under, under this new administration. I, and I, I wonder what your thoughts might be about, I guess, thematic ideas that Australian startups could be thinking about that might be driven literally from the White House in, in coming years. Sure, sure. For, um... Now, we've all been parsing the campaign statements and campaign speeches and pre-election sorts of statements from, from uh, President Biden to, to get a sense of granularity of where the administration is going on that point, Colin. And as of yesterday, we got a lot more clarity because USTR yesterday posted the president's trade agenda on its website. And this is the first real official document that we have from the White House that, that puts in black and white what they're going to be looking at. 
And if you just look at the top three, I think they bode really well for Australia. Number one is tackling the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And that involves all of the, the med tech that you're talking about, the way you're, you're all over this. This is um, you know, a, a key area of, of focus for this administration, getting us through this pandemic, getting us ready for, the, for whatever the next global health um, crisis will be. There's gonna be a lot of focus, a lot of investment. Number two on the priorities for this administration is a worker-centric trade agenda. And that means doing business with partners who have worker protections in place. And we know here in Australia, they've got world-class, some of the highest, best worker protections in the world. So I think that bodes really well. And I'm really excited about number three on the um, president's priority list focuses on uh, creating a path to sustainable climate and clean energy. And this is, a, this is a real interesting point, because if you look at the newspapers, I think a lot of the media here are trying to generate this as a wedge issue between the United States and Australia. But from where I sit, I see it as just a huge opportunity. Again, the states that I cover here in Australia are Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania, Northern Territory. And in these parts of the country, you have some real innovative programs going on at the state level. And in the startup community, what this means is all those startups out there, and I hope some of you are on the line, who are working on things like plant-based meat or meat alternatives or sustainable fashion or battery technology and all these things that go along with sustainable energy, they're just gonna be huge opportunities under the Biden administration to, to work together. So I'm real excited about it, Colin. Um, well, you, you mentioned before about the about the regulatory environment. Of course, I expect very few of us have read as much about the regulatory environment in the medical industry as we have in the last few months with the uh, COVID nineteen vaccines and, and what have you. H how have you found the regulatory environment? I guess the, the legal environment, the protection of your of your IP. I guess the, the things that typically people think about as being really big barriers to med tech coming from other countries. Um, so. That's the regulatory pathway in um, in the U.S. is actually one of um, one of the um, one of a few factors that have led us to identify the U.S. as an attractive market for for Navi, uh, but likely also so for uh, many other um, medical device companies. So um, the FDA, as I mentioned, uh, has recognised and has provided and is actively providing support. Um, to for pediatric and neonatal devices so recognizing that um, there is a gap in medical devices that are entering the u.s market that are designed uniquely for pediatrics and neonates uh, so smaller patient groups and recognizing as well that sometimes it's not just about shrinking a big med a medical device that's designed for adults from a from a sort of adult size to kid size it's actually it actually requires quite a bit of unique design recognizing that there are unique characteristics and traits and um, anatomical differences between babies children and adults um, so the fda provides uh, like for example um, if navi did go through the fda regulatory pathway um, our submission fees could be waived uh, in recognition of um, that uh, that our device is targeting pediatric um, uh, patient populations. We also, uh, the FDA also uh, provides uh, opportunities to have pre-submission meetings with um, businesses and groups like ourselves that are um, working on developing a medical device and are intending on taking it through the FDA regulatory pathway. And that is distinct from many other regulatory um, pathways uh, in other markets, including the, thera uh, in, including the TGA pathway here in Australia, so the Therapeutic Goods Australia. So despite our situation uh, and being physically located in Melbourne, Australia, we have actually not been able to have as healthy or productive or have as many conversations with the TGA as we've been able to have with the FDA all the way in another continent. Um, the FDA also has various regulatory pathway options. Um, some of which would actually mean a much shorter uh, time frame to allow our medical device to uh, successfully get regulatory approval and therefore be able to um, sell in, in the US market. So from that perspective, um, 
the US is by far a much more attractive environment simply because it means um, we'll be able to hit the market much faster than we would um, should we pursue a different regulatory pathway. And uh, we would also be able to reach a much bigger market, as I've already mentioned previously. Um, in terms of the legal uh, environment and how we've gone about protecting our IP, um, a lot of that has been done here in Australia and we've had great help with um, a lot of um, sort of IP attorneys here based in Australia. Um, at this stage, uh, IP is wholly owned by the Australian company um, and some of the discussions, early discussions we've had around looking at understanding what the investment environment might be if we should we want to tap into US capital. Some of the some of the discussions we've had have indicated that in the past um, investors based in the US have a preference for IP to be owned and held by a US company. Um, some some recent conversations we've had indicate that that might be shifting in our favor where uh, US investors might be more accommodating towards investing in foreign entities where IP might be owned by um, uh, overseas companies or companies based elsewhere. Uh, we do have a US subsidiary, so we do have the option of flipping up should we need to. Um, those are very live conversations we're having within the business at the moment as we commence our Series A um, later this year. So I'm going to turn to some questions now and I'm going to ask the first one of Rachel and, and she'll understand why because um, for, as I mentioned, Rachel and I have worked together on a number of projects including um, venture capital education and I've, I've always been, as Rachel knows, I've always been fascinated by the fact that American venture capitalists want to invest in global companies, but they then want them to set up down the street. So be a global company, but come and work in Palo Alto or something like that. And um, when I saw Kelsey's question, so Kelsey's actual question was, does physical distance between uh, Australia and the US make bridging the gap in relationships with, with people in the US, dif in US difficult? Um. I'm going to actually add some nuance to this and it actually depends on what your business model is and whether you have a B2B product that requires or, or whether your product requires kind of field sales and direct sales or whether it is say a SaaS product where people can self serve and become customers. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to expand on that, but before I do, I want to make a point. Um, call upon a point that Mike was just making earlier around increasing the surface area for serendipity. I'm not going to lie. I think that the distance um, and our inability to hop on a plane and go to San Francisco for a few weeks and have a ton of coffees and beers and meet people is adds a challenge. Now, the good news is that everyone has stopped doing that. So now the playing field has been leveled and everyone is connecting now on Zoom. Now, it means that, you, again, to that hustle point, you have to work a lot harder to get that Zoom meeting, to have that coffee meeting, because you're not going to bump into them at a cafe or be at a conference and someone turns around and introduces you. So it does, the onus is on you to kind of um, create serendipity or create introductions uh, in a way that proximity used to um, enable. So I will acknowledge that that is hard, but now everyone is doing that. Even people in San Francisco aren't bumping into each other anymore. Everyone is home. Um, not to mention the fact that so many people have left San Francisco. And so even people you know, in Silicon Valley are actually in Tahoe or Miami or in Denver. Um, but you know, it's an interesting year for everyone. Now to my earlier point where I was talking about sales. So there are um, some companies that I'm invested in that have an enterprise sales model and that requires, it's a little bit lengthy, it's chunky, and that requires creating a deep relationship with the decision maker. Um, and you know, it's a big contract and it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a chunky sales deal. What we found is those companies need boots on the ground. Um, and that's either because they come with a, a book, they come with a network, they have pre-existing relationships, they know how to sell, let, well, let's just go with software, they know how to sell software in this market. Um, and because it's a lengthy sales cycle, they are there to have those touch points. Now, one of the things that I love investing in, and one of the things that I think that Australia is uniquely positioned to be great at, are products where customers are able to self-service. They discover it. 
they're able to sign up, swipe a credit card and start using it right away. And Australia should be world class at this. We have, um, you know, Atlassian, Canva, all of these great examples of products for which, you know, Canva had 50% of their sales in the US before they had one person based there. And we can be world class at building incredible software that allows anyone to self service in a frictionless, seamless way. And all we have to do is be able to take credit card payment in that currency, have some basic localization, and off you go. You're literally making money in Australia while you sleep. And so when you think about, do I need to be in America or not, you should really think about what is my business model? And right now, if I can't be in America and I have a choice of business models, maybe I want to think about a product-led growth one where I can acquire users through you know, performance marketing, convert them into users, allow them to use the product without ever having to speak to us. So that's just something to consider. Yeah, right. Um, right. I've got a sort of related question, which probably also goes back to the business model, which is the, the positives and negatives of partnering with US companies to be the retail face of your company in order to get rapid penetration. So you know, do you, do you become the customer facing business yourself or rely on other people? And I, you, know, you can see the advantages either way on that one. Um, again, it, it depends on what your product is and it depends on if you have, you know, if your product is actually a technology and you can still have a very healthy business, almost like white labeling it, then that, you know, your customer is different. Your customer is the retailer. Um, yeah. I personally uh, believe in having as direct of a relationship with your customer as possible because that's where you're going to deeply understand their problem. You're going to get their feedback and convert that into better product and experiences. So I am not a big fan of entering the U.S. through some sort of third party. Um, there are well-trodden paths for how Australian companies can enter the U.S. and stand on their own two feet. A market like China, that's a very different situation. But for the U.S., um, I would always encourage you to try and go directly to your, as close to your customer as possible. Okay. Uh, uh, Mark, I think this one might, might be for you. Um, which of the states which are friendlier for operating a U.S. office, uh, as in um, Texas for taxes, California for tech talent, I mean, they're, they're all, I guess they're all trying to compete with each other and trying to find that, 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 uh, that value proposition. Totally, Colin. Right now, the, uh, you know, it's almost as if someone tipped the, the table, table over. And it used to, be, used to be pretty easy. You figure out where your, where your customers are, you figure out where your investors are, you figure out where the market is. And somewhere where the most, we have the most overlap would determine whether you are in Silicon Valley or New York or Boston. And, and then, at this point, with these cities emptying out because of COVID and and um, expenses and just the and just the comfort with remote work, you have all these other states are competing for all of this talent and the idea of bringing tech workers to to their states. So whether it's Colorado or Florida, um, Texas is a bit ahead on this, but all the states see the value of this and they're putting together different packages that um, that. We're going to vary depending on sector, but it just seems like there's going to be just a bigger, bigger range of choices for, for startups that want to think about where they put their foot down in the U.S. Well, I, I think the competition is good for, good for the startup community. They can sort of choose their poison, if you like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, why I've got a question. What are the advantages and disadvantages of, do, of doing clinical trials in the U.S. versus clinical trials in Australia? I was actually going to say in response to some of the discussion and points that were raised earlier that um, physical location is so important, especially for a business like ours when it's medical devices. So there is always going to be a component about our business that um, has a direct interaction with uh, patients, clinicians, in a physical location, like hospitals will always be there, and there is an there there are there, there is a there's a huge aspect of um, the service that hospitals deliver that can't be remote. And while you know I look after finances, strategy, and all the boring stuff about the business, there's a ton of work that our engineers do that can't be done remotely. So. Um, for example, the, the work that we're doing in hospitals here in Melbourne, and we're really fortunate to be based in Melbourne, given the hospitals are in close proximity, they're very, very friendly when it comes to undertaking clinical studies. And we've been, we've been, we've been also very lucky and grateful to have two un underway. And um, uh, we, 
we're in a position where we can use our clinical prototype in the clinical setting, observe and undertake research of our prototype in use on a patient and be able to observe firsthand how the, how, how the product is performing, um, how clinicians are interacting with, with our prototype and, and what other improvements can we make and how does it interact with other, with, with other, uh, other equipment in the clinical setting. So that, that element cannot be underestimated because that, that, that can't be something that you just put a camera on and, and turn zoom on and do an observation or, or be able to, to have that same, same level of involvement and interaction and, and take away the same amount of learning. Um, but likewise, uh, when we do have, uh, when our product is ready for the market and when we do start selling in the, in, in the US market, um, again, I, I don't think you can sell a medical device um, without being without having some physical presence in the, in the US, whether it's um, in the East Coast or the West Coast, depending on which hospitals we decide to go with in the first instance. Um, there is um, uh, one, one thing that we have recognized is that there is still a huge element of um, risk involved in going straight to the US market. So Rachel, you joked earlier about Australia being a remote market and you can you can make mistakes and stuff up and people might never find out. But the converse <laughs> is true in the US. It's our biggest and largest and most important market. So any stuff ups are costly. So in, in, in going to the US market in the first instance, um, uh, the biggest mistake we can make is to do it without a physical presence and likely from one of the founders in the founding team to do so ourselves. And again, there's heaps to learn in terms of uh, post-market learnings when, when, we, when our product is in a US hospital um, being used by clinicians and the way clinicians interact with it, how it, how it sits among other equipment, and there's tons of those in a clinical setting, um, and how uh, and potentially pick up anything that we haven't through the studies that we've done here in Australia. And so now to your point, Colin, and your question about clinical trials in Australia and the US. Um, so Australia has, there, there are a number of advantages to undertaking a clinical trial in Australia. Um, first being, you know, the friendly environment and the willingness of hospitals to participate in clinical trials. Um, there is also the R&D tax incentive, which uh, again, uh, shouldn't be overlooked because that's a massive bonus for undertaking any research and development activities here in Australia, of which clinical trials will be one of them. And, um, and also given that we're Melbourne based, we do have strong relationships with hospitals here in Australia, which um, works in our favor. So all of that um, goes towards, uh, uh, I guess, a cost effective way, if you like, for us to be able to gather the necessary clinical evidence uh, for us to gain, uh, for us to um, be successful with the regulatory approval. And to some extent, um, the FDA has recognized that clinical evidence here in Australia is also, uh, can, can apply and can be used in the US. However, there are also advantages and slightly different objectives to potentially undertaking a clinical trial in the US as well. And that's to gather, um, to some extent, um, evidence that will help support um, market adoption. So being able to say that it's been used in the US hospitals in a trial of some form and be able to demonstrate slightly different claims with um, a trial in the US could be helpful. So um, those are things that we are considering. And I guess what I'm highlighting is that the benefits and advantages and the objectives of doing so could be quite different. Right, right, thank you. Um, Mike, one, one for you, I think. Uh, I, I actually know uh, this founder, I, I, know, I know his company quite well. Um, and it's a question about doing business with government in, in, in the US. Mm. Um, this is from uh, uh, Canev. Um, and they're a, they're a, he's one of the founders of a, of a startup that does sort of traffic monitoring, I guess, but they can often use AI to predict future traffic events. So Terrific. looking at patterns of foot traffic, they can work out, are there gonna be too many people in the Burke Street Mall to comply with COVID-19 rules and, and those sorts of things. Mm. I think they're currently doing monitoring in Melbourne, Toronto, London, um, but obviously uh, you know, get, get, working out how to get to the US market. Do you still need, you know, do you need to be there? Are there ways of interacting with government? You know, that type of thing. I think uh, you know, work with government, just like work with business, work, work with investors, everything's online at this point. It's just uh, nobody's traveling, nobody's doing in-person work. But I think for working with government, um, like the health sector, like Wei was pointing out, and like for 
what Rachel was mentioning before about just the having the opportunities to to meet people at conferences and to have those per person to person interactions is so important that even once COVID is in the rearview mirror for us, there'll still be value in putting boots on the ground and having those those relationships and finding those opportunities in person. Um, I think that's that's going to be true in the government sector as well. And and talking about boots on the ground, there is a there is a point that I, I did want to make because it did come up in a lot of the, the episodes and in my conversations with founders about how they got those boots on the ground in the US. Often it was the E3 visa, which is something I really want to, to footstop for, for this audience because this, among all the work visas that the United States has, this is the, the, the fastest to get, the easiest to get, and it's only available for Australians. It's, it's such a golden ticket to get those boots on the ground uh, it's an advantage that Australians have over any other country. So if you have a, a business idea and are able to to uh, to qualify for the visa, which isn't that hard to qualify for, if you can get out there and make those contacts and work the rounds and, and see if your business is viable and and really lift it off the ground using that that avenue. So I just want to throw that in there also for the discussion, Colin. No, that, that is such great advice. I mean, we talked before about what a competitive market it is. So if you can find an advantage, you, you, you should take it. And finally, the, the last question, the, op the options for incorporating in the US, do you find an investor who will take care of it? Do you use a legal service, a consulting service, or is it something you could take, you should just take care of yourself? And I could probably ask all three of you this question because I'm, I'm sure you'd all have a view. I can speak to our experience, which was pretty recent. We used a consulting service that specializes in helping businesses, uh, Australian businesses incorporate in the US and uh, American businesses incorporate in Australia. And they look after um, the establishment, the incorporation, as well as uh, ongoing compliance as well. Right, thank you. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, flipping up, uh, sometimes it's the kind of, it's usually like a US Series A investor that might require it as part of the investment. And so they can help either with their own networks or introduce you to a consulting service like Wei mentioned to help you flip up. Um, I would recommend that you get plenty of legal and accounting advice prior to doing it um, because it there are some complexities. There are some more so than getting it right. There are opportunities to optimize um, to really create advantages. So make sure you talk to professionals on both sides of uh, the Pacific before you do it. And each state is different. So it's really, really important to uh talk to that professional one last thing um one of the mantras i use is don't make a hire until you know how to fire employment law varies from state to state in america um and just general compliance around what it means to make that hire so while you might be keen to get those boots on the ground and to hire that person make sure that you understand employment law it works very differently than it does here understand if you know what the state-based employment laws are and make sure that you are both compliant and cognizant of those before you make that hire particularly if you're going to go to California. <laughs> okay, well, we're, we're, it's easy. You can fire anyone for any reason. <laughs> um, well, we've, we've hit 6.30 and we, and we said we'd, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd take an hour. We've got a couple more questions, but uh, unfortunately we've, we've run out of time. And I know Rachel's got to get to a dinner with uh, Didier Elzinger from, uh, from Calturan. So um, to, to Mike, Way and, and Rachel, on behalf of our, our audience, uh, thank you all very much. Um, I think, Mike, we'll look forward to the next uh, stage of your of your podcast, which you might just want to briefly mention what your what the focus of those podcasts will be. Sure. So again, this, the podcast is called Thirty Seven Degrees Latitude, and it refers to the the fact that Melbourne is at thirty seven degrees south, and Silicon Valley is at thirty seven degrees north. And we're talking about connections in the startup community between founders from Australia who make that journey to uh, to the United States. And the first seasons um, are all Australians who have been to the U.S. and have come back. Season two, which we're in the middle of now, is all about Australians who are, who are still in the U.S. making it happen. So hope folks will, will, uh, will tune into it. Um, it. There's a lot to learn from the experiences of those who have gone before. Thanks. And, and why thank, thank you again. You, you and uh, everyone else at Navi are such great supporters of uh, of the ecosystem. I was on a judging panel with Alex Newton recently. 
Um, and and I, I always love looking at companies like uh, Navi and some of the other companies that come out of biodesign. You now you put people with great engineering skill together with people with great management skill and you find companies that turn out to be successful. Who, who would have thought? I think uh, if you look at companies like, uh, like Navi and, and others who have been through, I think, and, and Rachel, you'll appreciate this because I think you're on the Accelerating Commercialization Grant um, uh, Committee. I think, and this is coming out of one subject at, at one university, I think the, the teams that have come out of biodesign have attracted close to $4 million in accelerating commercialization grants. And these are projects that started off as, as subjects in a, deg in, in a degree. Yeah, we see plenty of them. So keep them coming. Yeah, and, and finally, uh, Rachel, I, you know, we, we, we normally work very closely together. I, ha I haven't seen you very much lately, but um, I will say, and I know you won't be embarrassed by it, um, Rachel's first fund has gone uh, phenomenally well. So, some very, very close and dear friends were too late and wrote their checks out and couldn't get into it. Um, we, we won't name names and, we, and I've gotten over it. Um, but I understand you will be launching a new fund in the not too distant future. Yeah, that's right. So cohort two um, is being ready to spun up and you are right in that um, we've had really overwhelmingly positive demand. So we're gonna be spinning up cohort three just a few months later. We're not oh, gonna wait for the year to run out, so. Yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the one of the recognised weaknesses in the Australian e ecosystem is a lack of angel investors. So I think for one group to be putting up three funds is just fantastic news for any, anyone interested in, uh, in in entrepreneurship. So thank you all again, and uh, look forward to seeing you all in, in person sooner rather than later. See you later. Thanks, Colin. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you.